Hi, I'm Jim Warner from NASA Langley Research Center. I've been at NASA for about 10 years now, um, focusing on uncertainty quantification research uh, for a few different applications uh, currently. So I'm going to give you an introduction to uncertainty quantification for modeling and simulation. Um, you know, I'm going to try to keep it pretty high level. You know, this is a mini tutorial. It's one hour. It's not a short course, so you're not going to leave here as UQ experts, I hate to say, unless you already are one and you're here to heckle or something like that. Um, but I'm going to try to give a, you know, a brief overview of some of the main concepts within UQ, um, try to introduce a couple methods and how they kind of fit together in an overall uncertainty quantification workflow. Um, so yeah, hopefully expose you to concepts. Maybe you can make some connections with your own work, figure out you know what you might need in your own workflow to incorporate some of these ideas. Um, before we get started, how many statisticians do we have here in the room? Trained statisticians, there's one, Greg, thank you. Engineers, do we have engineers trained? Okay, cool, any computer scientists? folks. All right, cool. So a little exposure from all the different groups. I'll talk, talk about how UQ is sort of like this intersection of those ideas. So we only have one statistician. That's probably good because, you know, UQ people get heckled a lot by statisticians because we do a lot of stat stuff and they claim we kind of reinvent it as like a new buzzword, something, something. So we'll see. And maybe we can talk a little bit how I envision that UQ is slightly different from applying statistics um, from a traditional standpoint. So we'll get into that a little bit as well. Um, and finally, if you have questions, please interrupt. I don't really feel like giving a one hour monologue to you. So just ask questions if you have them. I've kept things really high level, I think. And so if you want to get into some of the details, um, I'm definitely happy to chat as we're going through and talk a little bit more about um, the nuts and bolts of these ideas. All right, so um, as probably a thousand different UQ talks have started, I borrowed this quote from George Box. It's kind of overused at this point, but it's um, all models are wrong, but some are useful. Famous quote from decades ago now. Um, and I have a diagram essentially saying just that. And what we all know is, you know, when we try to make a prediction about something in the future, um, or try to predict something that we don't know, our predictions from our model are never a direct reflection of the real world or reality. And we all know this. This could be a log scale. I could be 100 times off or 1% off. We just know that there's some inherent wrongness or error to our model predictions um, in comparison with the real world. So that's kind of the blanket statement. Really, for practical purposes, the questions we really want to know are, you know, how wrong might my model be for a given um, use case? When are they useful from an engineering perspective? Maybe I can tolerate a 1% error, maybe, you know, 100 times error is way too much, maybe 1% is okay. And then how confident are we in their predictions? So in most practical cases, we don't have the real world result. We're trying to predict that, right? And we want to know if we don't have this value, how confident are we that we're close enough to that real world um, result to be useful for our application? So one of the ways that I like to introduce UQ from a high level is in a nutshell, UQ is the field or the suite of tools that helps answer some of these questions. So, you know, a proper UQ framework helps you answer how wrong might my model be and when it's when is it useful and it helps it helps you make your model more useful for your application. Um, so speaking abstractly, you know, for now, just for starters, back to the, the diagram here, if I'm making sort of a best guess or deterministic prediction, I would be simply getting, you know, a single prediction out of the model with these blue boxes. A proper application of UQ might allow me to predict a range of possible outcomes using my computational model. Um, and then I can, you know, revisit this type of, you know, situation. I can say scenario one, at least my range of outcomes that I'm saying is plausible according to my model at least encompasses this real world result if I was to get a measurement or something like that. So I'd say my model's useful in scenario one, whereas scenario two, I might say, you know, I'm, I'm saying basically the real world phenomenon is impossible according to my model, and that's, that's not so useful. So UQ, again, allows us to make these probabilistic predictions with our model, understand uncertainty um, associated with those predictions, and make our models more useful. Yep. So if you have uncertainty in the model itself, let's say the model itself is some piece of software, then you also have uncertainty in the input that goes with that. So you don't know exactly what to put in as the input, you got some of your value. And then you get to the output, and the output is sitting there. So combined here, is that the way you're looking at here? Or is it strictly the software? 
No, we'll talk about how the, you know, you can have uncertainty in the actual parameters going in. You can have missing physics, like a model discrepancy. You can have numerical errors, like with the simulation itself, and how that can all feed into like a holistic um, description of uncertainty. So, yeah. And then on the output side, you, you might be comparing to the criteria. Well, the criteria might have it. Yeah, for sure. And the data, this real world results might not just be a single point, it might be scattered. So yeah. Okay. Yep. Great. I already got a question on slide one. I like it. Thank you. Um, so yeah, moving forward again, I gave our poll in the beginning. Um, I look at UQ as sort of the intersection of these different uh, concepts or areas of expertise. So you have probability and statistics, obviously the applied math side, um, engineering, or really more generally the subject matter expertise. So it's good to know what's, you know, the inner workings of the model you're working with or the simulation, um, understand its behavior as you're changing some of the, the um, parameter values, and then computing is a big part of UQ as well. And I think me and Greg were talking a little bit, I was trying to carve out my, my idea of how UQ is a little bit different than traditional statistics, and I think it always implies this heavy computational side. I think we're always talking about models and simulations when we're applying UQ. I think that's one of the big factors. And typically, we're talking about models that are complex in the sense that they usually take a long time to run on a computer, at least moderately long, where you have to use some more advanced techniques to make a UQ analysis tractable. So I think that's usually a big component when people um, are talking about UQ as opposed to statistics. But there's certainly a lot of overlap there, um, for sure. Um, so I, to make a concrete definition here, I borrowed, this is Ralph Smith, who was actually taught the UQ short course at DataWorks before. This is from his textbook. Um, he defines UQ as the science of identifying, quantifying, and reducing uncertainties associated with models, numerical algorithms, experiments, and predicted outcomes. So that's sort of his idea. But then um, on the bottom, UQ helps imbue our models with what we know, what we don't know, and to what degree we don't know it in order to get a more complete picture of what we're modeling. So making our models more useful um, in a nutshell. All right, moving forward. So I talk about UQ a lot in the relationship between the real world and models, trying to make our models um, come to agreement with the real world. And here I have sort of a diagram of this interaction um, shown here. Um, I want to make sort of a declaration that this is the last time I'm going to look at a mathematical model being different from a numerical simulation. So moving forward, I'm just going to say model, and we're going to assume it's a computer model. Here I'm making the distinction just to make a few different points that, you know, in the, the process of doing modeling, usually we're going from a physical experiment or a physical phenomenon. We're trying to come up with a model formulation from that. So that's the physics or biology or chemistry of your phenomenon that you want to model. So first you'd have, you know, mathematical equations that govern that phenomenon. So these are equations on paper, differential equations, partial differential equations. Um, and then translating that to the computer becomes a numerical simulation. So how do we actually solve those um, math equations that govern our phenomenon? And in all parts of this process, we have different sources of uncertainty. I've given some examples here, um, sort of to your point about holistic treatment. Um, we have uncertainty from the experiment itself. Um, we have error or noise associated with measurements that we take. We have um, error or uncertainty due to a lack of knowledge that we can't take as many measurements as we want usually. We usually have sparse data. Um, the mathematical model, we might have input parameter uncertainties. There's usually coefficients or parameters of the model that are uncertain or unknown, um, boundary conditions. And then when you go to translate that to a computer, you also have discretization errors or other numerical errors that might contribute to an overall uncertainty or um, error in your result. Um, so yeah, we already went through model implementation. Um, the relationship between the simulation and experiment, um, in one direction it's calibration, so we can gather data and use that to calibrate a simulation so that it agrees with um, our physical phenomenon better. And then we also have verification and validation. So I thought it's important to include those ideas in a UQ talk. So often you'll hear the, the big acronym VV and UQ or UQVV. These, are, these topics are heavily related, so they're talked about um, together often. And I guess if you're kind of a beginner to UQ and V and V, I think one main takeaway from this talk is that verification does not equal validation. A lot of people use those interchangeably. I used to be one of those people, so that's okay. But those are totally separate ideas. So let's talk about that briefly. So model verification first, the process of quantifying the accuracy of simulation codes used to implement math models. 
So in other words, are we solving the equations correctly? So this is strictly about our implementation of our math model on the computer. Did we do that correctly? Are there, is it bug-free implementation, essentially? So this process usually um, amounts to having any sort of analytical solution to your math equations that you're trying to implement on a computer. So if you have a known analytical solution, you can compare your code to that. Um, in other cases, when that's difficult, sometimes we'll take a commercial code that we trust, something that's you know has thousands of users and developers, and treat that as sort of a ground truth. And if we have our own code, we'll compare to that to make sure we get good agreement. That's another way to, to do verification. But again, that's are we solving the equations correctly? Validation, on the other hand, is the process of comparing to the real world or the ground truth value, some measurement data that you might have. So that's the process of determining the accuracy with which the math models represent the physical processes of interest. Um, in other words, the, the short way to say it is, are we solving the correct equations? So again, that, that almost always involves a comparison to, to measurement data or test data to do validation. So two separate concepts, but both are important. You want to verify your model first, make sure you're solving the math equations correctly, and then you can do validation with any test data that you have to make sure you're, you're capturing the right physics or phenomenon of your, your problem. And at the end of the day, we'll talk about this more. We're trying to make a probabilistic prediction encompassing these different sources of um, uncertainty in the process and so make a probabilistic prediction of some quantity of interest. So rounding out sort of our introduction or overview, I just wanted to talk about computational models. So I tried to keep this tutorial pretty light on math. Um, I'll introduce some notation that I'll use here um, just to, to get that across um, early. So we're going to talk about Input parameters, we're going to call those x, anything that your model requires to, to execute and make a prediction. So any information your model needs to make a prediction is x. Your model will call m, and then the outputs are y. I noted here, oftentimes in the you know UQ literature, we distinguish between inputs and parameters. So parameters are usually things that are tunable, things that we have to tune to data, or things that have uncertainty in them. I'm going to kind of lump those together for simplicity in this talk. So X is just anything your model needs to run. Could be uncertain, it could be something that you know um, deterministically. And then on the output side, we often distinguish between outputs and quantities of interest. So I sort of look at outputs as sort of the raw data that comes out of your model. So let's say a weather model, for example, you might be able to predict rainfall on a, you know, a fine grid across the US, you know, 10,000 different data points. So that would be my raw output out of my model, but a quantity of interest might be the rainfall in Alexandria. So usually a scalar value or a small set of values that we particularly um, care about predicting. But again, I think today we're gonna keep it simple and we're just gonna talk about you know inputs and outputs um, more generally. I'll probably abuse um, notation and terms and kind of call them one and the same. So some examples I put first, um, sort of NASA-centric models that I'm interested in that I've worked with recently in the past few years, just as an, as an example here. So I have a collaboration with um, some folks in entry, descent, and landing department at NASA. Um, the model they're working with is a trajectory simulation model. So in this case, they're interested in predicting the trajectory of a re-entry vehicle entering a planet's atmosphere. So in order to run this model to make a prediction, we have to give it information about um, things like the atmosphere conditions, as well as the mass properties of the vehicle. And a, you know, an example of a quantity of interest is they, they care about you know, landing location, for example. So where is this, this vehicle gonna land given um, some specifications about the atmosphere and mass properties and others? Well, we'll talk a little bit about the end, if we have enough time, about a reliability analysis my group did for a new spacesuit that NASA's developing. Um, so in this case, we had our model that simulated impact to the spacesuit, um, for example, if an astronaut were to fall. I um, mean, we, you know, the, the kind of knobs or the, the settings we had to um, put in place in this model were the impact velocity, like how fast an astronaut's falling, what are the material properties of the suit um, that kind of control how much damage might occur, and then we would be predicting the max contact force that would um, result. And finally, we also work with some aerodynamics models. We're predicting lift based on some um, wing geometries and other things. Um, some more general examples, so kind of the classic one I use a lot when I introduce UQ is the weather model. So, um, you know, can we predict the path of a storm, for example, given temperatures of the ocean or pressures and wind speeds on a map or on a grid, and then disease dynamics models. So, um, 
I think it would be helpful if, you know, you work with a model or simulation, kind of keep that in mind um, during this talk. What are your inputs? What are your outputs? And maybe kind of make those connections to, to some of the concepts that we'll talk about. So I think this rounds out the intro. Is anybody willing to give me an example of a model that you care about in your work? Anybody have a something they're trying to predict? No predictions. No one wants to talk. That's okay. One I've okay. Go ahead. Uh, we usually do uh, what we call live fire testing yep. as as part of our uh, as part of our work here at IDA, uh, and it falls under the Department of Test Evaluation. So we're interested in predicting the environment of a piece of equipment, and figuring out whether or not that piece of equipment is likely to fail. There's a certain shop qualification program, but uh, when we're just doing a modeling and simulation, it could be higher than reality or it could be lower than reality. So sometimes we get a test and we get to go back and, and look at the test and then compare that to modeling and simulation. So one of the ideas that you presented here is one thing I could do is go back to the model or go back to the input and tweak them such that they match the output. But with hundreds of gauges, you know, it's not always easy to do something like that. But if you quantify the error in the output, and then let's suppose hypothetically it came out as an easy solution mm -hmm. or always over by 100%. Then you could just take your output and you could adjust it down by 100% and think that's close to reality based on all the test data that I have. Ideally, as a, as a simple example. Right. I think in an ideal scenario, you could find the inputs to your model, different inputs that adjusted that by 100% just by feeding in the right inputs instead of manually chopping down the output, right? Well, there's only so much you can do, right? Yeah, an, sure. An explosive has a... Uh, a similitude equation, and from that explosive uh, similitude equation, you have gauges in the water. And so uh, you might be dead on on the pressure, but still, it's the ship model that's off somewhere. Right. But it's a very complicated model, and it's going both ways, some are plus, some are negative. Yeah, yeah, and that's a good point. I'll mention that briefly, is that we're going to talk a lot about uncertainty due to unknown or uncertain inputs to the model, but sometimes you're just missing something in your modeling. You're missing physics. You've simplified something. You don't have the exact geometry of the thing you're modeling. So sometimes you just have a model discrepancy that you can't possibly match the output to the data by tweaking your parameters. There's something else missing. Right? That's another... Exactly. Yeah. A full-scale full ship is impossible to physics model right now that the data. Yeah. When you consider that a lot of that's due to cable friction, you can't model every cable in a ship with today's computers. Sure. Yep. Cool. Well, thank you. So one I actually forgot to put on here that I should have put is a sports sports performance model, some money ball. I was going to say I was going to, you know, use your college statistics to predict whether or not a baseball player is successful in the big leagues. I think that's a cool one. Um, the other thing to mention, too, is these are all, for the most part, like physics or biology based models. That would be an example of a data-driven model, which is totally fine for this type of framework, too. Um, these could be data-driven machine learning models, too. These are just happen to be examples. They're mostly physics-based or physics-inspired models. And um, Head Online has an example, um, uh, a multivariate binary response model with non-repeated test data and inputs on the order of 10 to the 6 complexity plus a very small sample size with many conditions. Sounds fun, Greg. Was it Greg? Craig. Craig. <laughs> That's a lot of input. So we'll maybe, yeah, I'm not sure if we'll talk too much about what happens when you have a ton of inputs to your model because that definitely complicates things. Or maybe we'll mention that a little bit, actually, one of the ideas. Um, anyway, so that's kind of the intro. Um, the goal is, again, we can't expect to get into the weeds on all these methods. So I'm going to try to provide enough information to know basically what to ask or search for. So sometimes when you're trying to get into a new area, it's just you don't know exactly what you need or what you should be searching for. So hopefully we can make some of those connections. I'm going to overview some really main 
concepts broadly, and then I'll leave everybody with some references that I think are um, helpful and important for these different ideas. So understand the why, the when, the what. So what does this method do? Why would I use it? Not necessarily how it works. We're not going to do too much math today. And then I'll try to provide some parallels. Um, and the, if we have time, I'll show a couple examples um, or an example from some work with NASA. Um, Usually when I give this, I guess we have engineers in the room. I was going to say, if this is a stats-focused audience, I assume we know this, but we'll go through it quick because we have sort of a mixed background. Quick review of terminology. Random variable X is a variable with an unknown true value. So it has, it can be described by a probability density function. I'm sure we've seen a bunch of this at this workshop. Um, so it just describes the relative likelihood that X takes a specific value. And keep in mind, we're going to consider that the inputs to our model are random variables. We're going to assume they're uncertain and they're described by some probability density function. Um, the CDF is just the integral of the PDF, um, basically. So the you know probability that X takes a value less than or equal to uh, little x on the curve. Um, I think that's mostly all I wanted to say about probability and stats uh, primer. Um, you can say a random vector is just a vector of random variables. So we're going to have, you know, if you have dozens of inputs to your model, they're all random. That's a random vector um, as your, your inputs to your model. The, maybe the last thing to keep in mind is that when we have a standard family of PDF, like a normal random variable or uniform or so on, um, it's easy with different programming languages to generate random samples or random values from those PDFs. So I'm going to kind of say a lot throughout this talk, you know, I want to generate a bunch of samples from this or that. If, if you're kind of unfamiliar, that sounds a little bit magical, but that's a really easy thing to do on a computer in kind of any language is generate random numbers. So that's going to be at the heart of a lot of these methods is the ability to generate samples from a PDF. All right, so we're going to get into some concepts now. This looks a little bit funky, but that's all right. Um, so again, we're going to talk about UQ in terms of this relationship between models and experiments um, and predictions and data that we have. I kind of broke down uh, UQ concepts into four main topic areas that I think are most important. We're going to talk about three out of four of these um, in depth. We're not going to talk too much about optimal experimental design, although I think that's a really cool idea. So I a couple nice talks here um, at DataWorks about that idea. Um, but we're going to go through all of these in, in some detail as we go. Um, just quickly now before uh, we get into the, the main meat of the talk, uh, sensitivity analysis will talk as a way to identify the important or most influential inputs to your model, the ones that have the biggest effect on the output that you're trying to predict. We're going to talk about uncertainty propagation as a way to make probabilistic predictions with your model, um, assuming that you know the uncertainty in the inputs. Optimal experimental design, again, we won't talk about that, but it's a, um, a cool idea that uses your model to try to inform your experiments. So how do we come up with the experiments, the design of an experiment that gives us the most information about the parameters in our model or helps us reduce the uncertainty the most? So if you're a statistician, this is just a fancy design of experiments um, from a UQ perspective, sort of the, the buzzword on the UQ side for design of experiments where you use a model to inform um, your experimental design. And then finally, model calibration we'll talk about as a way to actually estimate the uncertainty in your inputs given some measurement data. So this is sort of where all, they all fall in this relationship between models and experiments. So we're going to start with uncertainty propagation. So this is usually actually the last step when we go to make a probabilistic prediction. Um, but I started with that because Maybe it's the kind of the main concept for uncertainty quantification. A lot of times people look at uncertainty propagation as synonymous with UQ, but it's sort of the main step when you're making the probabilistic prediction. So we're going to talk about that first as you know, a class of methods that allows you to feed quantified un input uncertainties through your model to produce probabilistic predictions of some quantity of interest. All right, so um, here again is our, our model, our inputs, our output, or our quantity of interest. For uncertainty propagation, we're going to assume that we know these input uh, parameter PDFs, this uncertainty in our input. So for this section of the talk, we're going to assume we're given these, we've assumed them, we've gotten them from data. Somehow we have these um, input uncertainties. And then the question is, how do we estimate the uncertainty in our quantity of interest? 
So that's sort of the problem statement here for uncertainty propagation in general. We're given p of x. We have a computational model that makes a prediction for a given value of an x. And based on your application, you might be looking for different descriptors of your quantity of interest. So you might be interested in the PDF, um, kind of estimating the full probability density function of your quantity of interest that kind of gives you the most probabilistic information about your Q of I if you have the full PDF. Um, in other cases, it might suffice to have a coarser description of your statistics. Maybe you're just looking for an expected value or a standard deviation or a variance to describe, you know, the, the variability in your, your quantity of interest, sort of that, that mean behavior of your, your model, for example. You could also look for 95% credible intervals or 99%. Coming up with an interval such that, you know, you're 95% sure that the, the value of your QI lies within that interval. And then finally, um, you know, in a lot of engineering applications, NASA as well, we often want to know what the probability of exceeding some critical value is. So like a reliability analysis or trying to estimate what the probability of failure for a system is. So, you know, in NASA, we care a lot about knowing what the likelihood of something going bad is for a system or a structure, right? And that involves looking at what the probability is that our Q of I, the thing that we're predicting, exceeds some critical value. So that could be the stress in a system and, you know, exceeds the strength for that system and it fails. Yep. How important is it for you to get those input parameters right? Extremely important. Good question. Yeah, so we'll get to that in a little bit, but right now we're just going to assume we know those. But, yeah, that's that's a big deal. I think, yeah, we'll, we'll emphasize that a little bit in the upcoming slides. But, yeah, that'll have a huge effect on what this looks like. So. Credible prediction interval will encompass the the noise from your data as well that you use to um, like calibrate input uncertainty. But they're yeah they're close in meaning. Yep. Um, let's see. So probability of exceeding a critical value. Yep. So I want to discuss uh, maybe first that depending on what you're looking for here, so there's there's different uncertainty propagation methods that are tailored to get you these different answers. So if you only care about getting an expected value, there's certain methods that'll target that and do it the best, just like calculating probability of failure. There's classes of methods that look specifically for that. Um, I'm gonna talk about sort of the most popular uncertainty propagation method, Monte Carlo simulation. It's also general purpose in that it'll give you all of those things on the bottom. It can get you a PDF estimate, as you know, statistical estimates for um, you know probability of failure and other things. So let's talk about that. I think you know you should leave today if you don't know Monte Carlo simulation. Maybe you already do. Knowing Monte Carlo and you know even how to implement it on a computer because it's a simple idea, but it can be powerful even in its simplicity. Um, so main idea of Monte Carlo simulation. Repeat this procedure, you know, some number n times. We'll talk about that. Generate a random sample of your input parameters. And again, we're assuming that we're given these. We're assuming that it's easy to sample, because often it is if you have a you know a standard PDF for these things. So generate a random sample, plug it into your model, and compute and store the output. And that's it. Repeat that n times. And at the end of that, you have you know, a bunch of these outputs to your model, some number n, uh, just a collection of data describing your output. Um, do post-processing on that set, uh, set of samples to estimate those statistics that you want. So I have this big collection of data, these, you know, outputs from my model. I can make a histogram, for example, to estimate, you know, the shape of that distribution. Yep, go ahead. Can you do this quasi analytically by saying that, you know, let's say that I have a 5% uncertainty of the pressure I know that my pressure is going to be between whatever 1.01 or 1.05 and uh, 0.995 or 95 um, atmosphere. Couldn't you then take that those two balance and plug them into your equation and say that my output is going to be the result between pressure equals 1.05 and pressure equals uh, 0.995 and use that as your error bars for your um, I think only if your model is simple enough, like if it's linear, can you do something like that? Like if you have a Gaussian uncertainty in the input and then your model's linear, will your output be? Oh yeah, sorry, <laughs> good good point. So the question was basically, can I do this analytically or semi-analytically? So if I you know, assume some 
uncertainty, like an error bar on my inputs, or if I assume it's Gaussian with some standard deviation, can I directly get, you know, what the distribution or the error bars are on my output? And I think you can, assuming it's a really simple model, like a linear model, where I send something that's Gaussian in, I know that what's coming out is also Gaussian if my model is linear. So in some certain situations where, yeah, your model is relatively simple and linear, you can do that. Yep. 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 This is great. It's, it's, this, this thinking is what we've been toying with on a Monte Carlo, on a large complicated model. Can we do what you said? And as a sensitivity study initially, to see, first of all, is that parameter, that input parameter, as important as we think it is? Yep. Because maybe it's not going to matter much to the top levels, in which case, back to your point, it doesn't really have to be very accurate on the P of X3. X3 is not affecting the bottom Great question. Yeah, and that'll segue into, we're going to talk a little bit about sensitivity analysis as a formal way to find out whether these things matter. But you could simply do that if you have Monte Carlo simulation implemented. You could just adjust your uncertainties and see what happens and just say, you know, if, if I, you know, have more uncertainty in that, how does that affect my QOI? Maybe it doesn't matter. And you can kind of see manually that these things don't have a big impact on the thing you're predicting. So you can, you can learn a lot from a Monte Carlo simulation with some caveats, as I'll mention um, soon. But yeah, good, good comments, good questions. Um, so again, yeah, this is a simple process. Repeat this, generate random inputs, run them through your model, post-process the outputs. You can get a histogram to estimate what that full distribution looks like. You can make estimators like the expected value is just taking the sample average to give you kind of the expected behavior of your model. And then you can even look at these rare events like the probability of failure. So this is basically all I would do here to get this is take my n outputs and just count up how many exceeded that critical value and then divide that by the total number. It's basically just the proportion of samples that fail in my Monte Carlo simulation would give me um, an estimator for the failure probability. So I have a really simple example of this um, in practice using, uh, so I think the last time I talked about this, it was to a structural engineering audience. So this is a simple structural engineering um, example, but this could be whatever, this is pretty generic process. So in this case, I have a beam. This could be like a bridge, and I have a distributed load, W. So this is a force per length acting across the beam. And then I have a concentrated force in the middle. And I'm going to assume that these are both uncertain um, input parameters. So I don't know exactly what these are. They, there's some uncertainty, and I've assumed that they're Gaussian in this case. OK, so that's my input parameter uncertainty, two inputs that are um, random with some normal distribution. Uh, my computational model is just a, it's just actually a simple equation in this case. It could be something more complicated. But again, it takes in these two values from my forces and my loads, and it calculates what the max deflection is of this beam. And let's say that I'm interested in um, estimating the expected max deflection as well as I want to know kind of the extreme or what the chance of failure is. I'm going to assume if this thing deflects about a half an inch or something like that, I'm going to assume that my beam or my bridge or my spacesuit fails. For this case. All right, so this is just kind of visualizing what we're going to do here. So this is me generating random samples from these distributions. So this is just using a random number generator. They happen to be skewed to the right, but that's just a coincidence. So the vertical line shows three random values that I've pulled. I plug each one of those into my model, and then I get three different values for max deflection. So that's just Monte Carlo with three samples. So typically with Monte Carlo, we do a lot more than that. So I've done 10,000 here. I've just done this in a loop. Get random sample, plug it in the model, and then collect all my outputs and then make a histogram. So this shows sort of like statistical estimators now of what the max deflection is in my beam. Um, I've calculated the average or the expected value to be about a half an inch. And then this was my um, estimate for essentially probability of failure here. I want to know what the probability that that max deflection is greater than or equal to 0.54, and it's 0 0.0032 in this case. And you can kind of see that here. I have a failure threshold, and there's just a few samples that exceeded that value that I've called, um, you know, failing. And so that's my, my probability of failure estimator and my expected value estimator just by doing that simple process now with Monte Carlo simulation. 
I just point out this is Python code, just that this is relatively easy to code. You can do this in R, Python, C, Excel. You can make a spreadsheet that does this stuff. Um, again, random number generators in Python just look like this. It's inside of my for loop. I run my model, essentially. Here my model is something simple, but it could be an executable running on a supercomputer. Um, you know, to evaluate the model for each sample and then just collect and do post-processing here. So really simple script to implement this idea. Again, this is a particular structural engineering example, but this could be, you know, your own random inputs and then this could be calling your own model as again, like an executable, you know, a, a different Python function, an equation, or, you know, you name it. So, okay, before I go on a couple more main concepts in this example, does anybody have questions on that? procedure. So relatively straightforward idea. I'll talk about the caveats of, you know, how it gets difficult in practice, but the idea itself and coding it up is, is very simple. All right, so a couple of points, maybe secondary points here is convergence. So in this example, I assumed 10,000 samples. My value for n was 10,000. Um, so just like any iterative method, the more iterations we do, the more accuracy we're going to get. We're going to converge to some value as we continue to, you know, get more and more samples. And that's what I've shown here. So this is the estimate for my average, my expected max deflection, and then this is my probability of failure estimate as I take more and more samples. So you see at first we have a lot of variation. It kind of jumps a lot around a little bit, and then it converges to some value. Here, true value, I've just used something like 10 million or a huge number of samples to get a reference. So at some point, they kind of stabilize around some, some value, and you can see that they've converged. So I guess that's one important idea is that you need to make sure that your estimate with Monte Carlo is converged um, by doing something like this and looking at, you know, kind of monitoring the convergence as you increase the number of samples to make sure you've kind of settled in at a, in an answer that's consistent. So on the bottom, I've just put the um, percent error in the estimator compared to that reference value. And I want to make a couple points. So um, one point about Monte Carlo, the convergence rate is on the order of one over square root n. So this is from the central limit theorem. Um, so that's relatively slow. It means I need basically 100, more, 100 times more samples to get another digit of accuracy. So that's relatively slow. But the cool thing about Monte Carlo is that convergence rate is independent of input dimension. So if I had 10,000 inputs that were all random, this convergence rate would still have the same order, which is a nice thing. So a lot of the more advanced UQ methods actually get more difficult as you have more inputs. So sometimes simple Monte Carlo ends up being the best just because you can use as many inputs as you can in its general purpose like that. Other thing I wanted to mention, um, rare events um, can require more samples to estimate. So convergence rate is the same, but it can still require more samples. And we see that here, I've highlighted that on the, the y-axis, that this error is, you know, an order of magnitude or a couple orders of magnitude higher. Um, and I guess kind of intuitively what's going on here is it's a rare event by definition. So that means I need more random samples to actually see that rare event happen. So if I only do, you know, tens of samples, I might say that I have a 0% chance of failure. I just haven't evaluated enough um, possible input parameter combinations to know you know how likely failure is so rare events like this usually take a lot more samples to run they're more of an expensive analysis to try to um uh, to try to carry out so because of that there's a lot of methods that have popped up that are more advanced that you know specifically try to calculate rare events more efficiently monte carlo is not necessarily the, the most efficient way to do that all right, so that's point one on convergence. Always good to try to verify that your Monte Carlo estimators have converged. Um, I also wanted to make a point about correlated inputs. So this goes to the point of knowing your uncertainty in your inputs. So on one hand, that is, did you get your distributions right? A second order question is, do you have the correlations between your input parameters right? So here I kind of made the implicit assumption. I didn't say it out loud, but I assume that my two loads were uncorrelated from each other for this analysis. So I have some normal distributions. They're uncorrelated. So if I looked at the joint PDF, I'd have something like this. These are contours of the um, probability density here in two dimensions. The green dots are my um, random samples that I've drawn from Monte Carlo. And this is the result I got earlier. Um, the interesting thing, though, is if we assumed we had correlation between the loads, which we, you know, very well may have in a practical example, we have parameters that are correlated with each other. 
Um, my input distribution would look like this. So from you know basic statistics, if I have correlation, I see the skew in my PDF. That means you know if F takes a high value, then W is more likely to take a high value if they're highly correlated. Um, and what happens then if I were to do a Monte Carlo simulation capturing that correlation, I would get a different result. Um, and in particular, in the tails of that distribution, I would get you know a pretty drastically different result. Um, and you can see if I were to estimate my probability of failure, taking into account that correlation in my input parameters, it would be four times more likely to fail. Um, that's an important point to make. So if we ignore correlation, we ignore the fact that you know these loads are you know more likely to take extreme values together. So when one load is high, the other one's likely to be high. And that is a worst case for my structure. So trying to capture these correlations, if they exist, is really, really important um, to, to modeling and setting up a Monte Carlo simulation. It goes, goes to this point. I mean, even if you have the distributions more or less you know, reflective of reality, if you ignore that correlation, you could still get a result that's um, pretty far off from what would happen in reality. So definitely another um, thing to keep in mind with Monte Carlo simulation. Any questions now? Yep. The yeah, correlation can only be embedded by, by math, right? You can have to add something. Embedded by math, did you yeah, say? Yeah, like I did. If you, right. If you want to correlate the two loads, then like one would have to be a function of the other. Or something. Yeah, or I could, you know, if I could somehow get data on this, you know, I could estimate the correlation and the data. Here, they're, they're normal random variables, too, so it's easy to kind of embed the correlation. If I estimated this correlation from some data, then I could make this joint PDF pretty easily. Um, and we'll talk about, too, maybe we're probably going to run low on time, but model calibration is like a formal process to estimate um, uncertainty in your inputs that actually gives you estimates of correlation naturally in the process. So, yep. Um. I want to make sure that I understand okay. what exactly is happening. Okay. We're picking input parameters, correct? Um, <laughs> feeding them through a model and getting outputs, correct? Yep. And you're suggesting that we should randomly pick the inputs in order to get outputs, correct? Um, more or less, let's see, go back to the kind of the Monte Carlo simulation overview. Um, yep, that's what I'm saying. So, yeah. Okay, did you have more to the question? Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> it seems like if, if we were to instead use a sampling scheme, uh, like for example, some of the space fund design the schemes, rather than the random sampling, because the thing about a Monte Carlo type simulation, if you randomly sample from the entire space, as you mentioned, you're gonna have very slow conversions. Mm -hmm. And you're also gonna have like clumping in the space. So it seems like a sampling scheme, like for example, uh, space flooding type design scheme would have faster convergence to to the distribution that you should have, and you can still you can expect to die by just adding things up. Expected values, all these things are still intervals, so you just add up the points from, that come from that sampling scheme. That seems like it would be much faster, and more efficient. There's certainly yeah a lot of ways to go faster than Monte Carlo. So this is the the basic method. But also the most general purpose, I mean, a lot of times this, you, you know, you might fall back on Monte Carlo sample as like the only way you can solve the problem. But there's certainly quasi Monte Carlo methods and more advanced ways to sample the space so that you can cut down the number of times you have to run the model to get a good estimate. Um, I didn't mention too, I meant I alluded to the fact that there's ways to get these different statistics quicker. So there's important sampling to get you know, the probability of a rare event. So you actually draw samples that target the tails of the distribution, and then you reweight them to make them, you know, the estimator unbiased. So yeah, there's definitely a lot of ways to do this more sophisticated, you know, do the sampling in a more sophisticated way to reduce the number of model valuations you have to do. Yep. That's further study. That's the, you know, the 102 course after the 101 that you can, <laughs> you can take next next year. <laughs> but yeah, good questions. Um, let's see. Yeah, so you can have undetected non-conservatism if you ignore correlations was the main point of this little exercise. Um, some takeaways. So I think, I mean, we took a lot of time to cover that, but I think that's good. I mean, Monte Carlo simulation, again, simple idea, um, but you can learn a lot about your model um, just by doing a Monte Carlo exercise and, again, adjusting the uncertainties that you're assuming and seeing what happens is a good thing to do with a model. Um, it's non-intrusive 
that means we don't have to mess with the model at all to make this method work. You can just use it as a black box, we say. General purpose in the sense that I can get all of the statistics I want. I can estimate the PDF, the expected values, the you know rare events. And it's relatively simple to implement. The huge caveat, as we've gotten some questions about, it can be challenging or infeasible in practice when you have an expensive model. So it you know, often requires running your model thousands, tens of thousands, or even millions of times. And if your model takes anything, you know, over a fraction of a second, that's often not possible. So you use more advanced techniques. Um, I have some a couple slides on surrogate modeling is one popular way to introduce a faster model to do Monte Carlo simulation with. Um, but there's a lot of, you know, advanced ways to either reduce that number of model valuations you need or introduce a faster model is usually the name of the game. Um, has a provable convergence rate regardless of input dimension, so that's good. And then we saw that, you know, this is a main theme, improperly specifying input uncertainty or the, you know, the correlations in your parameters can have a significant impact on the results. All right, so that leads to the question that we've had too, how do we quantify input uncertainty? So estimates based on expert judgment, or if you have a big data set, you can estimate um, those uncertainties. So we'll talk about model calibration next as a way to use even a limited amount of measurement data to estimate uncertainties in the inputs. Okay, so that's the next component we'll discuss um, quickly. Uh, model calibration is a way to explicitly quantify um, input uncertainties using experimental data. So you can start with an initial assumption, um, initial guess for what your uncertainty might be, then update that using some measurement data. All right, so starting point for uncertainty propagation, we assumed we knew the input distributions. Now we assume those are unknown. Instead, what we're assuming here is we're given some data from an experiment that we're gonna call D, uh, generated by some experiment uh, E, you know, that depends on our input parameters. We have some measurement noise or representing the uncertainty <laughs> with our measurements for the experiment itself that we'll call epsilon. Um, we're assuming here that we have a model of the experiment. So our usual M has a subscript E. So that means I, you know, I have a way to predict the same thing that my experiment is measuring. So there's a correspondence between this D and this Y. They're essentially the same quantity. We're making that assumption here. So if that's the case, um, we want to be able to estimate what inputs basically led to that, that data. This is an inverse problem since we're you know, taking a measurement of the output of our model and estimating what the input was or the uncertainty in it. So you can do deterministic calibration. This is a common thing to do. Um, in a deterministic approach, we try to find the single best parameters that result in the best agreement by minimizing some error metric. Um, so, for example, the sum of squared errors, and if you are familiar with machine learning, um, this is the same kind of idea where, you know, your machine learning model would be this Y that depends on some parameters. You want to find the parameters that minimize the difference between the model and then your data. So it's the same idea here. We're just assuming, you know, typically or a lot of the times this is a physics-based model that depends on some parameters, and I still want to, you know, find the parameters that match or cause predictions to match that data. Um, so in this simple toy example, this is like a, you know, a linear model. My X is my slope. It's so Y equals XT. And I've just found the best value for that slope that minimized the difference between my model and my data points. So that works, but it doesn't facilitate uncertainty quantification. So what we really want is a probability distribution for X that takes into account um, uncertainty or, you know, noise in this data um, or variability in the data. So we want to use probabilistic calibration. So the result of our model calibration um, we want is a PDF that I'm calling here probability of X conditioned on or given these observations or data. So conditional probability of what my input um, uncertainty is given that I have some measurement data that um, gives me information about it. And if I were to plug that into my model, I could get a probabilistic fit to that um, data that I measured. So I, I sweep a lot of the details out of the rug here. Typically, this is done with Bayesian inference. There's a lot of good talks um, at this workshop on um, Bayesian methods, Bayesian inference. I'll talk about the main ideas of how this works, though. So intuitively, we want to formulate this approach such that the probability of my inputs is high when the error is low and vice versa. So if I plug some value of x into my model and it's close to my data, I'm going to say that's pretty likely candidate for what my input is. If I plug an X into my model and it's far away from the data, I'm going to say that's not very likely. So 
it's essentially intuitively what happens when you formulate this with Bayesian inference. You get a probability distribution that behaves in that, that sort of way. Um, so in this process, you start with an initial guess called the prior distribution and kind of the Bayesian formalism. Then you update that using the measurement data, what's known as the likelihood function. And then this distribution is called the posterior, basically what happens after we update our prior beliefs about these X parameters with some data. And just kind of a diagram of what this looks like. You start with a prior distribution. A lot of times we don't know what these parameters, you know, what values they might take. So we might do something like a weak or a non-informative prior. Um, basically just something that's assigning relatively similar probability to all these values of X. Sometimes I know that a parameter is positive. So I say, I'm gonna put a uniform prior distribution from zero to infinity. That's something you can do. Um, and then in that case, your answer for what P of X is gonna be, that blue line is gonna match the likelihood. Basically what your data says is kind of the answer you're gonna go with. So you're gonna rely more on your data if you don't give it a strong prior. On the other hand, if you give it a strong prior, you'll find that the answer you get out looks like the prior. And this is one of the criticisms of a Bayesian approach. It's also can be a strength if you actually know, you know, if you have reliable knowledge about what your X value can be, you can put it into this process and help with solving that problem. But again, that's a criticism because some people think you can steer it in the, you know, the wrong direction just as easy as you can steer, steer it in the, the right direction. Um, so I just, you know, showing some anecdotes from some NASA work. Oftentimes when we do model calibration, um, we do it with a simpler component scale test. Uh, so we might have a, a larger assembly model. In this case, I have a, a full assembly model of spacesuit impact. So this is impact on a full model of a spacesuit. In this case, we have some parameters that govern damage in this material that we want to calibrate. And we actually use a simpler model and experiment to calibrate those parameters and then transfer them to the larger model. So in this case, we have a simple, just a slice of material that was used in the spacesuit. They did a test, um, you know, basically tested low impact or low velocity impact, measured the force first time, and then we had a simple model of what that experiment was. We did model calibration to estimate uncertainty in these uh, material parameters and then transferred those to that larger model. So oftentimes when you're doing calibration, it's not with, your application or your assembly model, it's sometimes it's with a, you know, a simpler component scale model that you kind of feed up into a larger model. And then we, we did this process also with building a model for lunar regolith. So we were interested in what would happen. Yep, I'm running out of time. I'm only through two concepts. Great, you can look at the slides online. Um, but uh, yeah, so this was another case where we were trying to come up with um, parameters that describe the lunar regolith or the soil on the moon. We had some data that we found actually in, in an old textbook where they had a rover on the moon and inserted a penetrometer into different locations. And this is a force first depth curve. So we had a model that predicted force first depth and we wanted to know what parameters of this model would match this data best with uncertainty estimates. And we did this sort of calibration process here as well. Um, so we calibrated with, again, a simple model of this probe going into the soil. And then when we had, you know, we, we trusted these estimates and these parameters of the soil model, we put them into that, that bigger, you know, assembly model of impact. So that's typically how this goes in practice. You'll, you know, usually calibrate with a simpler model to a test, and then you can transfer that to a larger model that you actually use in your application. Um, we'll blast through this. I suppose this is kind of the takeaways here. So Probabilistic calibration, um, as opposed to deterministic, gives you input uncertainties based on data and accounting for noise. Um, that naturally includes estimates of correlation. So if you have multiple inputs, that's a nice thing about this type of method. You actually get those correlations out, as, as well as an estimate of what the noise level in your data is. Um, less data means you have more uncertainty. More data, less uncertainty, so you can converge to, you know, you know reduced uncertainty the more data you have, which is intuitive. Um, and then there's well-established methods for doing this, you know, Bayesian inference, Markov chain, Monte Carlo, or some of the, the buzzwords there. Um, caveats can require specific expertise and experience. So some of the sampling methods you use for in this type of problem, 
are sort of an art rather than you know a science trying to get these sampling methods to converge well it's, it takes some tweaking of the parameters prior distribution as i alluded to is sort of a controversial thing um, it could be more nuanced than you think if you give it bad information you're going to get a bad result out you can kind of steer it in the wrong way if you're not careful and it's also computationally expensive relative to deterministic calibration um, which is something to keep in mind. And that's sort of a main theme that came up with Monte Carlo is that UQ is often expensive um, because we end up evaluating our model so many times, really evaluating kind of the range of outcomes that are possible. Um, I'll blast through this quick surrogate modeling an idea again, because UQ is expensive because we have models that often take hours or even days to run. We can't insert them directly into a UQ workflow. So we introduced surrogate modeling. There's some nice talks on surrogate modeling here at uh, DataWorks, idea that we want to introduce some faster approximate model into our UQ process uh, that you know runs faster and is still a good representation of that original high fidelity simulation. Um, usually generate a bunch of training data up front with the original model, train you know a machine learning model, some sort of uh, regression model to to match or map that data from the inputs to the outputs, and that gives you a surrogate that you can evaluate a lot faster. So pick your poison. There's a ton of methods to do this, as we discussed. Um, you know, everybody has their favorite method to do machine learning or regression. Any of them are fine. I just point out here in this slide, no matter what method you use, you want to validate and make sure that your surrogate model is actually reflecting what your original model was doing. And you can do that by leaving out a testing data set um, to compare what your surrogate model predictions look like in comparison with the original. So surrogate modeling, introduce an approximate model that usually runs in a fraction of the time, like speed up your analysis, make things go faster. Um, we'll skip ahead, sensitivity analysis, sorry we're out of time, but this is a formal way I mentioned. You can set up a Monte Carlo simulation and just sort of adjust your input uncertainties and kind of see what happens see you know changing one input how much does that affect your output sensitivity analysis is a formal way to do that or you know a collection of methods that help you do that directly um, based you know it's categorized either by local sensitivity analysis which is a little more limited or global sensitivity analysis actually ranks you know the inputs to your model um, it's a really powerful thing to do sometimes even just the end of your analysis if you just want to understand more about your model you can do a sensitivity analysis and find out what parameters have the biggest impact on your, your output. Almost out of time, uh, I was gonna talk about spacesuit reliability. Um, so a cool example, our, our model was simulating impact damage to the spacesuit. Um, we were interested in what might happen if an astronaut were to fall on the lunar surface um, and try to predict whether or not we had enough reliability due to fall events. Complicating this analysis is there's a bunch of things that are uncertain about this, how fast an astronaut might, astronaut might fall, what the material parameters governing damage are that I alluded to, variability in that lunar regolith. We don't know exactly how much energy the regolith is going to absorb. So we went through this process, um, used some of these ideas. I'll just click through quick. <laughs> so we applied sensitivity analysis to understand what the most important material parameters were that controlled damage in the suit. So we kind of ranked those in order. Once we had those parameters, we're, you know, we're going to focus our efforts on trying to quantify uncertainty in these ones that have the biggest effect. So that's this is sort of sequentially how you might apply these different ideas. First, identify the important parameters use data to update or estimate uncertainty in those parameters, the ones that you found to be important. Now, once I have uncertainty estimates, I can do uncertainty propagation. Again, usually that final step to make a, um, a probabilistic prediction. So here we estimated what the probability of failure might be in the suit. Um, side note, we use surrogate modeling here too, because this is something that took a couple days to run, um, even on a supercomputer. All right, and then I already talked a little bit about how we came up with a lunar regolith model using the idea of model calibration was another important part of that um, project. Wrapping up, so UQ provides a framework to quantify what we know, what we don't know, and what degree we don't know it in the context of modeling and simulation. Monte Carlo simulation, I think, I, we took a lot of time to talk about that, but I think that's one of the kind of the main methods that you should know about in UQ if you're you're new to it. So it's general purpose and simple to implement. It can be tough to know which input parameters should be treated as random. You can use sensitivity analysis to tell you which ones to consider. 
be a difficult to assign probability distributions. So how do we estimate uncertainty? A good tool for that is model calibration. And then it can be intractable to do this when you have really expensive models, you can use surrogate modeling to overcome that. Um, pitfalls, yeah, convergence. If you're not converged, that's a pitfall if you don't check convergence. Um, again, assuming there's no correlation we saw can um, have an adverse effect. Failing to validate a surrogate modeling model and then not accounting for model discrepancy or model form uncertainty, which we didn't get to talk about. Anyway, there's references here. Um, I think these slides are on the website, so you can just pull them down instead of jotting all this stuff down. But uh, my email is also there. Happy to chat about any of this stuff offline, too. And, um, you know, we're over time. Maybe I'll take a question. I guess, what time does the... It starts to break down. Okay, let's all get out of here. <laughs> Find me. <laughs> oh, okay, gotcha. Well, anyway, thanks for coming, guys. Appreciate it. Sorry we ran out of time.